Hello and welcome. I am Ia Meur Mishuli. I'm the Chief International Correspondent here at the Cypher Brief, and I have the pleasure of speaking with Ambassador William Taylor, who was uh, America's ambassador to Ukraine and has done many incredible things throughout his diplomatic career. Ambassador Taylor, thank you very much for being with us today. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to join you. Thank you. Let's start from the NATO summit. We have a major event coming up in Washington, 75th anniversary of NATO. What are your expectations in general terms first, and then we can move to Ukraine and other issues? So in general terms, uh, the celebration of this alliance, 75 years, it's a very successful alliance. Uh, it has defended Europe. It has defended uh, values that we all share. Uh, for 75 years, it's it's never been stronger. It's never been bigger. It's never had a bigger challenge uh, uh, than the than the Russian aggression against Ukraine, which we can talk about. Uh, but uh, NATO has stepped up, and even in the past two years, has demonstrated uh, that it can respond. Um, that it can is up to the challenge that it faces right now, um, and that will be the message I think coming out of uh, of next week's summit. NATO is often credited as the the most powerful or the greatest alliance which maintained peace and stability in Europe for 75 years. Would you agree with that assessment? I do. I do. Um, other alliances have come and gone, as we've seen. Um, um, there was a challenge. So I, I served at NATO uh, at the end of the Cold War in uh, the late 80s. Um, early 90s. I was in Brussels. I was at U.S. mission to NATO when the Berlin Wall fell in 1989. I was there um, two years later when the Soviet Union disappeared, imploded. Um, and, and NATO at that time um, asked itself, okay, uh, now what? Um, what are we for now that the Soviet Union is gone and there's no immediate challenge to, uh, to the security of, uh, of NATO members? Um, and it thought through this question uh, over a period of time. It got involved in some of the things that was that were difficult over the next couple of uh, decades, uh, including uh, Afghanistan and Iraq and uh, uh, other places out of area. They talked about, but but fortunately, um, NATO persisted and and lasted uh, because um, the challenge from not the Soviet Union but from Russia uh, persisted. Um, is still there. And as we know, as we see today, um, it, is a, it is the real threat to Europe. And in the case of uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Russia's war in Ukraine, we saw how united NATO became, uh, which was, um, some say that it's a, it was a calculation of President Putin to do have the opposite effect on NATO. And now we have two more members joining NATO, very powerful militaries, and Russia-NATO uh, border has doubled since then. So where do you see Ukraine in the NATO context? And what are your expectations from the summit as it relates to Ukraine? So for a long time, I have seen Ukraine uh, in NATO. Um, it needs to be in NATO. It has been promised to be in NATO. I was in Kiev in 2008 um, uh, when President Bush visited Kiev before going on to Bucharest uh, for the summit there in two, and the NATO summit in 2008, where um, the promise was made to Ukraine that Ukraine and Georgia, by the way, um, will be members um, of NATO. So I, I have been uh, uh, of that view since then, since before then. I was arguing for that in the lead up to that, uh, to, to that summit. Um, and in Vilnius, as we know, uh, they reaffirmed that promise. Um, and I hope um, that uh, next week um, here in Washington at the 75th uh, uh, anniversary summit uh, of NATO, that they will make even more concrete uh, this promise to Ukraine that it will become a member. And by, by more concrete, I mean taking some actual steps that will, that will begin the process um, of Ukraine joining NATO. What would those steps be? Because there is a hesitancy, at least from what you can feel from talking to people, there is a hesitancy, especially from the White House, about doing 
something very specific. So the White House is, together with a lot of other people, are 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 worried, um, anxious about uh, Ukraine actually joining NATO, actually becoming a member of NATO now uh, during this war. Um, yes, that's that's a source of anxiety, and and uh, that probably will not happen. That is the membership, the actual membership, the coverage. Uh, of Ukraine by, under Article 5 of the treaty, the full membership, probably not going to happen while there is active fighting going on um, in, in Ukraine. But there are things short of that um, that can demonstrate um, to the Ukrainians in the first instance, but to the Russians in the second in instance, that Ukraine is on an irreversible track um, toward NATO membership. Um, you know the the administration and broader NATO have talked about uh, have talked about uh, a bridge to NATO membership, um, and and so people will be looking, the world will be looking, the alliance will be looking, the Ukrainians will be looking for evidence that this bridge is solid um, and that it is one way. It's not reversible. They're on the track to membership, um, and there are other things that the that the NATO summit can do, you know, if they build up the support, they could actually offer the Ukrainians an invitation to begin negotiations. This would not be an invitation to membership yet for the reasons that I mentioned, but it could be an invitation to begin the negotiations uh, toward membership uh, in Brussels in the, at the North Atlantic Council um, in, in at NATO. Uh, this could certainly happen, and that would be a concrete step. This is, of course, what the Ukrainians are now doing with the European Union. Uh, they're not a member of the European Union yet, but they are negotiating seriously, um, concretely, uh, in, in a structured manner um, toward that membership. That's what NATO could do. And is that technically possible? Can NATO do that? In some cases, some of the technicalities come into, into play and NATO says, no, we cannot do this because it's not in our charter or we cannot just execute this. That's exactly what these negotiations could address. Um, there's nothing stopping Ukraine, there's nothing stopping NATO from accepting Ukraine into the alliance. Um, there, uh, the, the, the Washington Treaty uh, 75 years ago um, did, all it said was, if you're a European nation and you want to join, you can you can apply, and then the uh, members, uh, the members of NATO will say yes or, or no. They will they will determine whether or not the application uh, is accepted. Uh, so there's nothing that stops um, uh, NATO from accepting Ukraine, and NATO has used different procedures. You know, for a while there, back in 2008, for example, we, we were talking about a membership action plan. There's some earlier. Uh, members uh, uh, of NATO uh, used in, as they approached, as they applied for and began the process of joining NATO in East Europe. I mean, the Poles and the Czechoslovaks and the Czech Slovaks and the Hungarians uh, and others. That membership action plan was a process, but they didn't need that. Uh, you know, the, the NATO could change that and did change that. You mentioned, yeah, you mentioned uh, Sweden and Finland. They didn't have to go through a membership action plan. They just went straight in. There were some issues, of course, with some members, um, but they're in. Um, and the same thing, and or a different process, actually, could apply to Ukraine. That is, um, these technicalities that you mentioned, that's what the nations of, of the membership, the members of, of NATO should be negotiating with Ukraine starting now. Uh, starting now. And they, those technicalities could be worked out. That's what you do when you do the preparations. So it boils down to political will at the end of the day. It's political will. That's exactly right. And it's a recognition um, that Ukraine as a member um, would, make, would make NATO stronger, would make Europe more secure. Um, it would remove one of the problems, uh, one of the issues, one of the gray areas. Um, you know, if Ukraine is not in NATO, um, uh, but it's trying to join NATO, it's not covered by Article 5, the Russians are tempted, as they have been, um, to invade um, again. Uh, they, they invaded, uh, of course, in 2014 and then again in 2022. Um, if, uh, if Ukraine stays in this gray zone, um, uh, the Russians will be tempted again if it's clear 
um, that the Ukrainians will be in NATO, um, the Russians would not. The Russian, one thing the Russians have not done um, is attack a NATO member. Uh, not so far. Uh, deterrence has worked, and I think it will continue to work. Um, and that has, that has been the foundation um, of European security uh, un under NATO. Uh, former Secretary General Anders Fogh Rasmussen proposed an idea, as I'm sure you very well know, uh, to offer protection to part of Ukraine which is not under the Russian occupation at the moment, and then down the road to reintegrate those parts after the war is over. What do you think about this proposal? How viable do you think it is, and what kind of political traction does it have? All options ought to be on the table. Um, the Ukrainians, of course, are not ready uh, to give up um, on the occupied territories. Uh, the Ukrainians' goal, um, as we know, uh, which is our goal, was the United States' goal, is just get the Russians out of the country. Get the Russians out of Ukraine. That's the goal. Um, and when that happens, then Article 5 and NATO membership and all the benefits of NATO membership would apply to the whole country. In, in getting there, um, you're asking the right question, and, and, and the Secretary General Rasmussen is asking the right question, um, how to get there, what are the steps there? And one step could be, as he's proposed, um, to extend Article 5 coverage guarantees, security guarantees, to the part of Ukraine that is not occupied. Uh, the Russians uh, occupy 20% of Ukraine, um, um, and so that other 80% um, could be covered. Um, there will be there will be technical issues, as you indicated before, that could be addressed. But those are the kinds of technical issues. Those are the kind of issues that should be discussed right now. They, they should be starting right now. And if if that suggestion of covering part of eighty percent of Ukraine is a is a viable option, that ought to be discussed um, in these in these nego membership negotiations that should start now. To Talk briefly about what's happening in Ukraine on the front lines. How is the assistance that the United States already approved is trickling down? What impact does it have? Do you, do you have any information on that? It has had a very strong impact in both ways. Um, while it wasn't coming for that seven months that the Congress uh, delayed, sending that, uh, that support, that ammunition, um, that military assistance, that seven month, months was, was very costly. Um, it was very painful. Uh, the Russians took advantage of it. Uh, the Russians took advantage of the fact that the Ukrainians did not have the artillery ammunition that they needed to be able to stop the Russian offensive, these, these low level grinding offensive uh, offenses um, the Ukrainians didn't have the ammunition that they needed to stop them. So on the one hand, there was the absence of that, uh, of that assistance that had an effect. And now that that, that bill has passed, a supplemental funding bill has passed late April, um, uh, very quickly, uh, the United States uh, started sending that, new, that ammunition, resuming the supplies of ammunition um, and other weapons uh, 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 to, to the Ukrainians. And that's begun to to arrive um, in the past several weeks, um, and we've seen the results. We've seen the results. The uh, uh, the Russians, as I say, had taken advantage of that pause, uh, that lack of ammunition, um, and that that offensive by the Russians has been stopped. Uh, the Ukrainians have stopped it cold around Kharkiv, um, and and we can see the results uh, of of those uh, of those weapons there and. The other big change, of course, that was very helpful, in particular up around Kharkiv, uh, uh, was the decision by the United States government um, to relax the restrictions on the use of Western supplied weapons or U.S. supplied weapons um, that, the, the, that the Americans had imposed. The Americans had said, we had said to the Ukrainians, you can't use our weapons to fire at Russian military targets inside Russia. Um, and of course, that was a big problem, um, in particular for the defense of Kharkiv, the, the border along Kharkiv. Um, the Ukrainians couldn't dig in, couldn't build the, the fortifications um, uh, that they needed to be able to stop because the Russians from the Russian side of the border could fire at the Ukrainians trying to dig in, prepare fortifications, prepare defensives. 
So uh, that was a big problem uh, for the Ukrainians. We effectively were giving the Russians sanctuary um, on the other side, on the Russian side of the border. And that changed. Um, the administration finally changed and allows now the Ukrainians to use those weapons um, uh, on Ukrainian, uh, on Russian territory. Um, Ukrainians are able to use those weapons to engage military targets. Let's be clear. Um, they're, they're firing against uh, headquarters, ammunition dumps, um, artillery positions that are firing against, uh, you, firing at Ukrainian positions inside Ukraine. Um, so when they are, when the Russians are using their Russian territory to fire into Ukraine, now the Ukrainians can fire back um, using these weapons. So that's that together um, with the increased flow of weapons coming from this new assistance, um, uh, that has enabled the Ukrainians to pick back up and, uh, and stabilize the front. I have to ask you this. This question sort of persists every time a decision is changed or a decision is made from the White House towards Ukraine. There were, this sort of evolves in the same cycle, at least from um, observing for it from the distance. There is usually a no to something sophisticated or something really necessary and big that Ukrainians are asking, whether it's the, um, the F-16s or ATACMs or any other long range weapons. Uh, then there is a, a few months later, there is a response that, okay, we will, we will provide this to you. Same thing goes about the policy that you just mentioned. The United States did not want Ukraine to use um, NATO or American weapons on the Russian territory. And it changed. So my question is, what do you make of it? Why does this happen? And it's been over two years now, two and a half years that we're in the same cycle um, and we still see some of that. First no, then yes. How do you explain it? First no, then yes. Um, it could be worse. It could stay no. Um, um, and so it is a good thing um, that they've gotten to yes. The administration has gotten to yes on each of these decisions that you talked through here. You're exactly right. Um, and that trend continues. That is, um, uh, they started off um, um, with less sophisticated weapons, and then now all the way up to ATACMs, um, and every every uh, level in between, they've step by step, they have increased the sophistication and the capabilities uh, of these weapons. Uh, so they've gone in the right direction. The trend is right. Um, uh, the, the, the problem, of course, that it has taken so long. Um, and uh, when it does take long, that that's, that's bad for the Ukrainians. That's painful for the Ukrainians. That's costly for the Ukrainians when, when they don't have that, that capability during the time that there is this question and the debates and hand wringing about, about why, you know, why not send it. And then in the end, they decide to send it. Um, but they, so, so there is that delay that has been a problem, but the trend is right. Uh, they've continued to make the right decision after holding out for some period of time. Um, and they have gotten frankly, to the top of the, almost to the top. There are a couple of things that are still uh, a problem. That is, um, uh, the Ukrainians are not yet allowed uh, to use these ATACMs that you mentioned against, uh, against Russian targets, uh, airfields, uh, beyond the, deep, deeper um, into Russia. And that may come, you know, that, that may be the next step. Uh, there are some long range, very sophisticated drones um, uh, that, uh, that the United States has not yet provided to Ukraine. And that could come. Um, so there are some things that could come. Um, they should come more quickly. I, I fully agree. Um, there are a lot of people in the administration that fully agree. There's a debate each time within the administration. That's the cause of the delay because there is a policy debate um, uh, in this country, uh, uh, um, within the administration, um, Congress sometimes get involved as well. They've got views, um, on, on this. So it's, uh, it's, it's the way policy is made here in this city, um, uh, that, that causes this, this problem, but they eventually get there. And my, I am confident they will continue to, to get there and raise this bar. There is a sense of worry 
on the European side about what will happen in the U.S. elections. Without asking you anything specific about the candidates or how the debate went, what do you make of that worry? Do you think they have a reason or not? Of course. Of course they have a reason to worry. Um, you know, Americans are worried. It's not just Europeans. Uh, Americans are worried as well. I mean, they, there, are, there, are, uh, there are concerns um, that the strong support um, for Ukraine and the strong support for NATO and therefore the strong support for European security uh, could be challenged, could be questioned. Um, and yes, of course, that's a worry. However, um, it is also true um, that when you ask uh, the American people um, what their view is about, about NATO um, or indeed about supporting Ukraine, you get big majorities um, in support of supporting European security through NATO and supporting Ukraine through through weapons deliveries and other, other kinds of assistance. So the American people are very strongly supportive and that's reflected in the Congress. Um, it's bipartisan support. Um, it's House and Senate, Republicans and Democrats that have supported this, uh, the uh, assistance package, the supplemental package, $61 billion most recently. Um, uh, and that, that, was, that was approved. Um, it was even approved uh, implicitly, tacitly with support from from the the presidential candidate who uh, who people were worried didn't support it. So so there is this this sense um, that the American people and the U.S. U.S. nation uh, supports both NATO and the um, and the support for Ukraine. There you know there's a debate. There's there's clearly a debate. I mean you, you can't miss the debate um, in this country um, uh, about this. And and generally debates are healthy. Um, in particular, when you come out stronger and more united on this thing, and uh, and we know where the American people are, so I am confident um, that uh, that whatever the outcome um, of uh, elections, whether it's in you, these elections, elections of course coming up in Europe as well, whether they're European elections or American elections, my I am confident uh, that there will continue to be support for Ukraine and for NATO and support and support of European security. I love that. Always positive. And now, final question, uh, very briefly, if you would, what would be the worst case scenario after the Washington summit and the best case scenario in your view? Best case scenario uh, for me uh, would be the strong uh, invitation from uh, NATO summit leaders um, to Ukraine to begin these negotiations. I think that would be very good. There's also another part of that best case scenario will be a very, I'm pretty confident this will happen, with strong commitments of, of support for new military capabilities and new military uh, assistance. Um, uh, air defense is a big need. The Ukrainians need air defense badly. Um, Patriot missile systems, in particular the interceptors, um, uh, that are fired from these uh, Patriot batteries. Uh, I, the best case, I think, and I think, I'm, I'm confident this will, will happen. There are going to be strong commitments from the NATO summit uh, to providing this kind of assistance to, uh, to Ukraine. So those two things on the, on the weapons uh, side, as well as on the commitment to NATO membership side, would be the best case. Worst case um, is you don't get that. Worst case is there is disagreement among uh, NATO allies. Um, uh, about this, and they're not able to come to agreement on the two things and others that uh, that, that the NATO leaders will address. Um, that would not be good. That would send a bad signal, not just to the Ukrainians, but be a bad signal to send to the Russians that the NATO can't uh, can't uh, get its act together, can't unite, can't be uh, seen to be a strong supporter of both Ukraine and European security. So. Uh, I am, I am confident that the best case, the, the, I'm confident the worst case scenario will not obtain, and I am hopeful uh, that the best case uh, will. Ambassador Taylor, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate this. Yeah, it's a pleasure, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me.